Bridget, welcome and thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Katie. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I am excited to learn from you about mold and so many other things today. But before we jump into that main body of this episode, I also have a note from your bio that you lived in a rice farming village for a year. And I would just love to hear a little bit about what that experience was. Oh, that's, I totally don't even remember writing that. It's so funny. Yeah, I did. Um, I lived in Guyana in, in South America, a country not many people have visited. It's definitely not a tourism country. <laughs> Uh, I lived there and volunteered for a year. I was, I think I was 22. So it was a big, um, a big wake up call on other things happening on this planet. Um, so I think it was, it was a really good informative experience for me. I, um, taught English and literacy and a little bit about the environment actually, which we'll get into today. Um, and, uh, yeah, like didn't have, you know, uh, running water and electricity most of the time. So I think it was a really good, a good thing for me as a young person. I love that. That's something I've been encouraging my kids to do if they want to, is to take a couple of years in their late teens and see parts of the world they haven't seen yet and experience other cultures. I think that can be such a valuable teaching experience. And I, I think I've learned more from travel than from any class I've ever taken. So I love that you got to really immerse and do that for a year. And you also now have a deep body of knowledge around a topic that we're going to talk about today, which is toxic mold and all of the implications that come with that. And I'm sure people have heard of mold. And I know this is, you know, no secret that this exists and that there are health consequences, but to start broad, maybe define for us what mold is and how it develops sort of in a setting where it will impact humans. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, we've all seen mold like on bread or, you know, and, you know, this forest or or what have you. So there's lots of species of mold. It is a natural part of the world. Uh, you know, it's, it's meant to decay things really like that's its purpose. So it does have like its natural normal purpose. Um, the trouble is when we are living with it in a way where it's thriving, like more than we are thriving in an environment. I specialize in, in a book I wrote uh, on about a dozen species of mold that releases toxic metabolites to humans and mammals. But any any load of mold that's too high in your home or a space you're in, you know, frequently is like a burden on the immune system just because you're dealing with it. Um, kind of relatable to people who are dealing with allergies. You know, it's just irritating to the immune system. Uh, But certain species of mold do produce something that just happens to be very toxic to humans and mammals. So that includes like your pets. Um, And these um, toxic metabolites called mycotoxins are great travelers in the body. Um, They can enter a cell cell membrane, they can affect mitochondria, they can enter the brain, do all sorts of trouble in the brain, make certain areas inflamed or atrophied. Um, So they're really potent um, and the effects can be really anywhere in the body. I think people think of mold as just respiratory and it can be respiratory, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. You could go through a big, long mold ordeal and never experience any respiratory symptoms. So um, that's kind of what I focus on. It's something I went through in my own health journey. Um, and so, yeah, the issue of being at having it in your home, we can use a home as like the main example. It's where we spend the most time, either through water damage, humidity, um, you know, there's all sorts of ways, frankly, that water can enter our home, right? We can have leaks, we can have things that weren't installed correctly. Um, we can have something up, up with the roof, you know, it's not well maintained, we can have gutters cl- clogged, we can have um, the foundation around the house not draining properly. You know, we can have storms where, you know, I think probably where you live, there's a lot of storms that can cause damage, um, you know, water entering the home and just some of it we just don't realize has happened. So we don't address it. Um, And then sometimes we just don't know enough on how to address it properly if we do have like a big incident with water intrusion. Yeah, I think that's important context to understand that mold exists in the world and it serves a purpose. I think that's really valuable to understand. And that in nature, of course, I'm sure humans have come in contact with mold in different forms 
forever, but we just weren't living with it in high concentrations in our home environment, or that's when it can become problematic. I think of that as far as like we would encounter all kinds of things in nature in small amounts. It's always sort of the dose makes the poison. Um, and to your point, people, if I'm sure, seen mold on food in their kitchen or even certain cheeses, from what I understand, have mold spores in them. So it's not that humans can't handle some mild exposure to mold. It's kind of if that threshold is too high is when we start to see problems, basically. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so, yes, yeah, so, so that's someone is some of the argument people will make who really aren't as informed to say, oh, well, you know, mold is everywhere and mold is common. And and it's really kind of min- minimizing some of the really dangerous effects of it. You know, there's people who are literally like wheelchair bound, you know, because they've gotten so sick. So, yeah, it, it has a little bit to do with your own health history and your own you know, body when you come into the environment, but then the environment itself has, you know, a really uh, strong effect. So, you know, some people may be more affected sooner, some people later, but if you're living in a, you know, unless you have some kind of extra special rock star liver that can like process anything, you know, over time, if you're still in it and in it and in it, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna likely affect you. And you have personal experience with this as well. If you're willing, will you share your own experience and what led you actually to now know so much about mold exposure? Yeah. So after I graduated, I went to acupuncture school in New Mexico, and then I moved to Portland, Oregon, which we all know is a very wet place. (laughs) Lots of old buildings that are very charming. Uh, But when I got engaged, I moved in uh, to a house that was 100 years old that had different additions, you know, it was like a tiny house that had been added to and, uh, you know, none of this was visible or known, Uh, you know, it didn't smell funny, it didn't look funny. Uh, But there was mold in that house, and not just in one, one area, which we can get into later. Um, So, you know, other things were happening in my life, I was, you know, getting married, I had a baby soon after I had just opened a clinic. So I was getting more symptoms, you know, not sleeping well. And um, I say the early, early stuff was immune anxiety, not sleeping well, increased food sensitivities. But, you know, I did have this increasingly busy life and changes in hormones. So it was sort of attributed to that, but I did work incredibly hard on my health. You know, that I, that was kind of when paleo was getting famous or popular. So I was really cooking all my own food, bone broth. Like I took all like toxic products out of my home. But despite all that, I really was getting worse, uh, mostly in cycles of winter being worse, which I didn't really put it together. Um, But yeah, I was just getting like in the winter, I'd be getting, I it was like, I almost constantly had colds and flus. My glands were swollen you know, I was in, always in pain in my back. Um, my, I had breakthrough bleeding in my periods, you know, some anxiety, not sleeping well, um, having to be really careful with my diet. Uh, so again, like just kind of attributed to, to stress, even when I went to practitioners, even though I was really trying to manage my stress, you know, I was getting plenty of sleep and going to yoga. So, you know, this kind of cycle of learning, but still being sick went on for a while, probably eight years, seven, eight years like that. And then finally I got really sick. I got strep throat. I needed antibiotics. I was exhausted. This looking back is also when I started working from home. I got sicker, Uh, of course, not putting it together at all. Uh, And then finally, I was doing detoxes, IV therapy, you know, exhausted, just exhausted. Um, And finally, uh, a naturopath asked, is anything changed in your home? And that was like the first moment that mold was considered. I said, yeah, we have this musty basement, Um, you know, maybe, you know, so that's when we tested and found out we did have mold and there's a whole big, you know, story from there about fixing the home, you know, making mistakes and getting sicker in the home, uh, a long health recovery. Um, but I always encourage people who are in the thick of it, you know, you, you do get better. You can get better. It, it does take, if you, if you're like us with a, a home with a lot of different, um, 
water intrusion areas and your belongings are contaminated. Uh, your body has been exposed a long time. It's, it's, it's a long road and it's expensive and it's a big ask to do all of it. Um, but you can come up out on the other side with basically a new life, which is pretty exciting. Um, so yeah, I was learning, I was in the more working in pain and women's health. And I just had learned so much about detox and mold that I, pretty much felt like I had to, you know, I had to pivot in this direction. When I, you touched on some of the symptoms, as you mentioned, I live in an area that's also very humid and has a lot of storms and rain. Uh, actually, the neighbor who went through a mold experience, not even because of the storms, they had pressure washing that was done incorrectly that got water into, I guess, the eaves and the walls of their house. And it, oh. they didn't figure it out for years. And it sounded like somewhat parallel to your experience where their child was having all kinds of strange infections and even like injuries that were happening really easily and kind of broken bones, all kinds of stuff. And he was just continually getting antibiotics after antibiotics for this until they finally realized that mold was the actual root of it. But maybe speak to the symptoms a little bit, because to your point, it people would maybe think respiratory could be related to mold from an acute exposure, but there's a lot, it sounds like beyond that, and then it can impact the body in a whole lot of ways. So what are some of the main symptom groups that people would look for if they had potential mold, mold exposure? Yeah, I, I have noticed that the two biggest ones, but again, these may not be the two first ones, are brain fog and fatigue. Like when I really hit my sickest, those two things were just dominating my entire day. Uh, couldn't, no short-term memory. You know, I've had friends who are very intelligent, literally couldn't find their way back to their house. Um, so that when the brain is really affected, that's usually when you're like, man, I got to figure this out. Right. Um, and just fatigue to the level of like, just dragging, like, I mean, I, I, I share that, like, I started like kind of fantasizing about not having to wake up in the morning and, and it wasn't an emotional thing. It was just like a physical thing. I was so tired. Um, <clears throat> but those may not be the initial ones. So like I mentioned my initial ones, you're mentioning your, your neighbor's, child. I, with kids, sometimes it is respiratory or getting infections. Like you said, uh, I know kids are notorious like picky eaters, but it mold is really hard on the gut. So kids who are incredibly picky eaters, you know, always bloated, um, kids with the dark circles under their eyes. Um, I've seen that one a lot. Kids who are super constipated, uh, bedwetting, you know, beyond a, a normal age, uh, attention deficit, learning deficit, these all things could be, especially with kids. Um, with adults, um, depression, anger issues, uh, rapid weight gain, but it'll go, also go the other way with weight loss if you're just, um, you're nauseous, you're not eating enough. Uh, so when you know it's affecting the brain, the command center, that's affecting the gut in so many ways. Uh, and then the gut is, because mold weakens immunity, there can be so many different infections in the gut. And so um, you can be experiencing a lot of gut symptoms for sure. When I did a mold summit um, not too long ago, and it really made me realize that multiple food sensitivities is like a common symptom of mold. Um, and I think there's so much debate and talk about diet these days that we can normalize it. We're like, oh, well, I'm just sensitive to lectins and this and that. It's like, well, why are you sensitive to so many healthy foods? Your gut is just so inflamed and off. So that, that can be, uh, a symptom as well. Um, some people have skin issues like increased rashes, that kind of a thing, um, hair loss is actually one that we've been talking about more. It's not going to be everyone, um, but because of its effect on the thyroid and autoimmunity and nutrient absorption, sometimes your hair loss is related to mold. So there's a, there, there's more, but <laughs> there's a good smattering for you. <laughs> I would guess for a lot of people, if they even suspect mold, even just the beginning process of testing for that probably feels very overwhelming, not to mention the remediation and everything that has to come after some form of testing. But how, if someone suspects that mold could be an issue, how does a person even go about starting to test for that? Yeah. So 
nowadays the body testing is actually easier than the home testing in a lot of ways. Uh, it's a urine test you can do from home. Usually you have to do it through a, a ordering, you know, practitioner. Um, but I, I think I've only seen one false negative, you know, because it's a urine test, you've got to be pushing something out to get a positive. Um, but you know, we see lots and lots of positives. Um, so that test, you know, I used to say start with the home, but maybe I'm leaning a bit towards starting with the body just because it's a lot easier. And then, you know, okay, maybe these symptoms that I'm experiencing are related to mold. Um, the home, you know, it depends if you rent or own, right? You don't, if you're renting, you're not going to bring in an inspector. Um, you know, bringing in an inspector, gosh, I think it was $1,000 when we had it done. And that was year some years ago. So, you know, maybe over $1,000 now to get a really good inspection where they're taking samples and, um, you know, really checking all the attic and the basement and the the gutters and everything. Um, so there's just so many ways to, to slice it uh, in the home. So there all also are little home tests you can buy. Some ask you to collect dust. Um, some are plate tests where basically it gives a medium where mold can grow. Uh, the plate tests are the least expensive and you can put them in a lot of areas. You can put them in a car, you can put them in your workplace. So that can be a good option you know, it, every test has its like pros and cons, right? So, um, but the play test, it could be a good place to start. Um, the dust test is interesting too. Some dust test test not only for spores, but for mycotoxins, which is a practitioner I really like to see uh, and know about, right? You want to know if like the thing that, you know, it makes you really sick is, is in the home. Um, a dust test will not tell you where the water damage came from though, right? It's just dust. So um, if you are a homeowner and you have a positive dust test, eventually you will have to have someone who's a mold inspector or a contractor or a mediator come out and find the source for you or sources, frankly, it could be multiple places. Um, you know, I always tell people it really is a construction project. Like, it, unfortunately, it's not just like a, you know, wipe it down type project. If if you've got mold that's grown, you know, in inside your walls, in the beams of your house, in your floorboards, it is a construction project now and one that needs to be very carefully managed so that mold isn't flying all over the house, right, when you when you work on it. Yeah, and that brings up a good point as well. I would guess this is like can be a very large scale project. Is it possible to remediate the mold in most cases? Or, I mean, it sounds like when you start talking about wallboard and inside walls, that to me almost is like, it would be better to just move, but obviously you don't want to move and just leave a house full of mold for someone else. Um, but is it, can it be remediated in most cases? And are there any specifics for making sure you go the right direction with that and that it is done carefully? Yeah. So, you know, I lean towards I prefer people to move. Um, and as far as selling a home, I, I could, you know, I could be, you should fact check me on this one, but it just is a matter of disclosing, right? If you know there's a problem, either yes, you need to fix it before you sell or disclose it. Um, but I guess I've just seen so many people uh, remediate and it it's incredibly expensive. You know, like every home project, it gets more expensive than you think. It wasn't quite done correctly. The, the belongings are still in the home. And so they're still sick or they don't know why they're getting better because they, they think they did it right. Um, it's a huge project because the mycotoxins are so small, even smaller than a, a mold spore, which you can't even see. They're embedded in your linens and your books and your carpet and your couch. Even they go into your computer into like you know the fan. So if you're, I would, I guess I would say if you're, if you've got a real problem with illness in the family and you've got a big mold problem, kind of like you described with your neighbors. We'll have to hear what what they did you know, the amount of work you're going to have to do to get it to a good place again is, is a lot and a lot, and it's a big learning curve to get there. So 
Um, there are some companies who kind of specialize in people with illness in their remediation. Again, a quote you may get is going to be, you know, 30 grand, 80 grand, 120 grand. It's not going to be cheap. Um, so yeah, it's a lot. There's a, there's a book called The Mold Medic that talks about some considerations in remediation. Uh, I don't know if you know Mike, he's down in Florida. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, as a practitioner and who's seen so many errors, you know, I, I tend to say uh, move on. Um, and I, I know that's a really hard decision for people. You know, people like their home, their neighborhood, it's near their kid's school, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's at least good to really consider, um, you know, is moving best for me and is, is really kind of getting a fresh start, even with my belongings uh, going to be best for me. And I would guess, does insurance ever cover part of that process if, depending on the source of, if it was like water damage or something like that? I know that must be case by case, but are there cases where insurance is able to cover some of that? Yes. So if you have a sudden leak or storm, then yes. So uh, when it's something that's old, like behind the wall that you just didn't know about, they consider that more like neglect and they don't pay for it. But yeah, you're almost lucky if there was a storm or your dishwasher exploded or whatever, because it will be covered. That does not mean that whoever you hire knows everything about mold, but Really, if you have something sudden, you just need to act fast. And in pretty much every area, there are companies that do this emergency remediation. Um, 48 hours is the, the time window. So you, you don't want materials sitting beyond that. So if there is an incident, yeah, document, take pictures, call your insurance company, call an emergency remediation company, STAT. And that's the greatest thing, yeah, you can do. That's good to know. And I don't want to get stuck on the home side because it seems like this is actually, it can really impact human health. And I want to make sure we get to go deep on solutions for there. So I'm guessing we would have categories of people potentially listening, those who might have exposure and not know it, those who have had exposure and either gotten out of the environment or remediated and are still healing. Um, and hopefully also people who are not having any sort of mold exposure, um, but might want to prevent it or make sure that, that they're, you mentioned your liver being healthy, being a factor. Um, so let's talk about the human health side a little bit and maybe go through those categories. So if someone knows they've had mold Mold exposure in the past. Um, what are some of the ways in which they can help their body heal from that? Yeah, great question. So yeah, the, the most important point about the home piece is you've really got to get into a clean environment to heal. You really cannot heal when you are still in the environment. So we'll just put that one <laughs> to the side for a sec and assume that's happened. Um you know, how everyone detoxes in the timeline, it depends on the length of exposure and the person's uh, underlying health. So luckily with kids that we've mentioned a bit, kids can be the most resilient in healing because they do have so much like cell turnover and, you know, they're, they're just like, they just have more energy for the fight in a sense. So Luckily, with kids, the healing can be a little quicker and a little simpler. Um, so, you know, maybe a, like a little a little sauna time or um, sauna mat for them. Uh, they do really well with gut support. Some people are only doing gut support for their kids to 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 heal. Uh, I will say, you know, my son wasn't really symptomatic, but he was definitely in our moldy house. Um, and I really just feel like his body cleaned it out. Uh, if he were very symptomatic, I would have been doing more interventions. But I was like, you know, he's doing fine. So I guess there's really nothing for me to do. Um, so his kids can be arranged. And I think the kids is a little easier. Adults, you know, we've just been through more. Uh, we've had, you know, more years of other toxin exposure as well. Many adults like already don't have a great gut, you know, are constipated. Um, so there's sort of uh, a, a few aspects. So one is just doing the foundations, which I'm sure a lot of people on this podcast have covered, you know, getting fresh air, getting a good night's sleep, eating real food. 
you know, making sure that those are all in place. And then second step is actively supporting detox with things like antioxidants, um, binders, which are basically substances that um, physically or chemically bind up things in your intestine or your bloodstream so it gets eliminated. Uh, I love different lymphatic techniques while detoxing. So um, sauna, dry brushing, rebounding, walking. Um, I like Epsom salt baths. I definitely got into coffee enemas during this whole thing. Uh, not required, but I'm a, I'm definitely a fan. Um, and I always tell people like, you don't have, you know, you can find your own techniques that work for you that you like. Castor oil packs are also in there. There's so many things, uh, so many options, but just creating your own little routine where you're getting some lymph movement, you're getting some, hopefully some binding. If you don't tolerate supplements well, even just getting a lot of fiber works as a binder. So there's always options, right? So making a little de detox program for yourself that you can tolerate, um, making sure you're pooping through that whole procedure. And then lastly, which is kind of my biggest specialty is restoring all the body systems that were potentially uh, damaged. So your white blood cell count is often low, you know, leaky gut, you know, candida infections, all so many things. And those can, if you've had a long exposure, those can take time to come back, but beyond time, your body just really does often need a helping hand to recover from uh, all these things. So I think since I went through it myself, a lot of theories got disproven. So I thought, oh, if I just detox, everything will come back online. It's, it's not quite that simple. Um, yeah, maybe eventually, but the body's really dealt with like a serious toxic load potentially for years. Um, and you know, it just, it just needs help. Um, so, so, so the, yeah, those are kind of the aspects and, you know, it sounds like a lot, but you know, you just kind of be at whatever stage you're at. Right. And, and support, you know, if, if you're just, say you just moved and you're exhausted, like, I'm not going to ask you to parasite cleanse or, you know, do something really complicated. I'm just going to ask you to like rest and eat real food and, lay out in the sun, just like, you know, you can sometimes just keep it simple. And that's what you need at that stage. And I'm guessing as you're talking about this, and especially the implications of your liver being and staying healthy through this, that like your son didn't have symptoms is even if someone is exposed, it sounds like they're, if they have symptoms or if they get sick might depend on sort of their baseline of health to begin with. So it seems like, especially if we live in places where mold is more common, doing things as a general support for our liver and for our gut health, those can probably be beneficial across the board and of course helpful in many other areas as well. Are there any tips you would add to that list specifically in like liver support? Um, let's see. Well, I mean, glutathione is definitely like a favorite in the mold community for liver support. It's our kind of number one most um what's the word highest quantity of antioxidant. So there's different forms. Um, you know, there's liposomal form. Some people do NAC, which is more of a precursor. There's an antioxidant alpha lipoic acid that actually helps you like make glutathione and, and recycle it. Um, so I really like that one. Um, coffee enemas do help you recycle glutathione. So that's an option. You know, we saw one that's just like a gentle nano spray glutathione. So there's lots of options in there. And, and something I've been learning a lot about is how antioxidants work together to support each other. So I don't feel like antioxidants get like a lot of talk in the detox space, but, you know, other things that, that are in that network are like vitamin C, um, and CoQ10 I like, cause it gives you cellular energy. So, uh, you know, and if you don't have the budget for a bunch of supplements, um, colorful food is important. Not that food is cheap, is cheap anymore, but, um, you know, if you think about like colors and variety, which I'm sure, again, you've talked about on this podcast, or if you've read Katie's <laughs> cookbooks, um, you know, it really does make a difference, right? I think we, we tend to, in our culture, want um, 
the like the I mean great I you know IV therapy can be a great boost and you can get a glutathione push um but we can't always like afford that or access that or whatever so you know some things are so affordable like vitamin c or you know frozen fruits you know it could be a way to actually really support detox and then as you know like the liver loves protein and amino acids and onions and garlic and broccoli so um the you know the liver doesn't like I'm I'm fine with, you know, some fasting or detoxing, but the liver actually does love a lot of nutrition, right? So just getting really great nutrition if you're into organ meats, grass-fed meats, I think that's all great. So yeah, just remember like your liver is working really hard and it needs, it needs all the things basically. Yeah, I think that's great advice separate even of mold exposure, supporting the liver with all those nutrients. That's a shift I've made even in the last five years is to think of food, not even in terms of calories or macros, of course, making sure I get enough baseline of protein and healthy fats and things like that, but really trying to focus on nutrient density for whatever food I'm eating and just choosing the most nutrient dense food, which I feel like is also psychologically helpful because then you're focused on a positive versus a negative. And it's not a restriction mindset. It's a, how do I maximize nutrient density in the food that I'm going to eat today, which leads like you're talking about naturally to brightly colored fruits and vegetables and things that are high in antioxidants or protein sources that are especially high in different nutrients as well. So I think that's amazing advice across the board. And you also mentioned sunshine. And anytime I get a chance to give a plug for getting healthy sun exposure, I'm all about that. So let's talk a little bit about about sunshine and how that supports the body in this process as well. Yeah, there's probably like some fancy things about, I know know there's like how sunshine turns to gel on our skin that I don't totally understand, but I'm just a big fan of outdoor time. The air quality is better. Um, Depending on the time of year, you're getting vitamin D. Uh, You're moving your lungs, you know, if you're out getting some exercise. Uh, And then when we see and hear nature, it's very calming for our bodies. And that when we can like rest our bodies, rest our minds, that really lets healing happen. Um, So... Yeah, I'm always, you know, and light on our eyes is good for circadian rhythm. Uh, And it doesn't have to be, you know, fancy. You can just get out, you know, in your yard, like even just sitting, you know, sitting in a sunbeam with a cup of tea. There's so many ways. I just, I kind of like food. I love every variety of, of getting outside. Yeah. And I think that's one of the tips too, that is, doesn't cost money. It's not expensive supplements or any kind of complicated therapy. I think if everybody just got 10 to 15 minutes of morning sun exposure right after waking up, which is, I love that as more restful sun exposure where I'm sitting on the back porch with a cup of tea or coffee and talking to my kids. And then ideally in a perfect world, go for a 10 minute walk after every meal, which is also great for your blood sugar, but if not even just get that short walk at some point during the day, that's a free thing that I think over time compounds and dramatically can improve health and doesn't cost anything. So that's one I always encourage. I love that you mentioned that as well. And you mentioned another one of my favorite topics, which is sauna, which I think is another one that is helpful far beyond just any single symptom or single thing that a person might be processing. Um, I know there's the Finnish sauna study that talks about how it can even reduce all-cause mortality and risk of heart disease and dementia and cancer and everything. Um, And I often say if sauna were a pill, everyone would take it. And I know it's not an inexpensive thing and there are some more budget-friendly ones now, but maybe walk us through some of the benefits of sauna specific to especially detox and mold. Oh yeah. I mean, I feel like almost equal to how mold can affect every system, sauna can benefit every system. It's such a long list. So can benefits a good night's sleep, Uh, weight loss, calming the nervous system, clearing the skin. You know, we, we, we detox all sorts of things um, through sauna, heavy metals, mycotoxins. There was a a study done. I don't know if it was a formal study by a a a testing company I work with. And they just had people um, sauna for two months for an hour a day, which is kind of long, but uh, they and they did their mycotoxins before and after, and there was just like this incredible drop in mycotoxins, like to the normal range in two months. So, 
it's pretty really powerful for detox. Um, and then you can kind of stack things while you're in there, which I like too. Like if it's family time, maybe for you guys, or I do usually castor oil pack or while I'm in the sauna. Um, yeah. So, so immunity, it's also boost immunity, you know, I, during COVID people were definitely buying saunas because they were home more, which is great. Um, this is great for mood, you know, calming, but also, you know, if you're having kind of the winter blues, I think a sauna is a nice thing to have. Um, Let's see, what else? I think pain, it can be good for aches and pains as well. Um, I don't know. Do you I didn't want to add any, any to that list? I think that's an awesome list. And just, yeah, to echo everything that you say, I had that experience during COVID when our area didn't shut down that much, but it was definitely a pause on travel. And I actually loved all of those months off because of COVID. And I found some friends in my neighborhood that kind of became my sauna team. And we actually did a small sale sauna study because of the Finland study and how it, I mean, the claims in that one are phenomenal about how it can reduce all of your inflammatory markers. Like you said, it improves sleep. It's an exercise mimetic. So it mimics exercise most of the way, at least increase in heart rate, sweating, et cetera. So we tested all those things before and after two months of saunaing at least four times a week for at least 45 minutes and across the board saw a reduction in all of those inflammatory markers. And it's probably also the best I have felt in my adult life was when I was saunaing at least four times a week. And also during COVID spending so much time outside in the garden, so much time with my kids. And so I think that's one of, if it's available to you or if it's in your budget at all, I think sauna is one of those amazing health habits, like you said, that we can also stack with time together, or I bring in like gua sha tools and scrapers into the mm, sauna or massage that. tools. There's just so much you can do. And, and if nothing else, that quiet restorative time, I feel like is something we just often don't get enough of in today's fast paced world to begin with. So it forces you to sit still and focus on your breathing and take a deep breath, which I think also has tremendous benefits as well. Um, are there any other techniques or supplements that you recommend specific to mold detox that people should know about? I guess specific to mold, a couple things are nasal rinsing and potentially like steam breathing. Um, what's the other thing called that people do? That's um, uh, I forgot. I'm forgetting the word right now. But I just bought this like st simple steam inhaler on um, Amazon. So I, I was having some respiratory things um, just with like not really severe like phlegm or whatever, but like swollen glands and then, um, some asthma, uh, and ironically, like, especially after I moved away, you know, the body's just looking for, <laughs> looking for problems in a sense. So I moved to Arizona and, you know, developed worse kind of airborne asthma. So this, a steam inhaler is something you could do with kids, um, just can help calm the lungs. You can put colloidal silver in there. I don't recommend putting um, essential oils in there. I think it's too too harsh um, to be breathing that way, but you can do potentially like some different glutathione. Oh, nebulizer is the word I was looking for. I think since COVID, you can buy your own nebulizer a lot cheaper. Uh, so again, I don't know as much about nebulizing and the differences, but steam inhaler can be something that's calming for your lungs. Um, and then you, you can actually get colonized mold in your nose. Plus just um, the immune deficiency can cause infections to grow in there. So you can do, do simple. Um, I like that squeezy neti pot. Um, it's like a plastic one. Uh, you just put salt in there. Um, so I, when I was sicker, I would rinse tw twice a day with that. Uh, we also carry a, like a colloidal silver, just simple spray. There's different, you know, some sprays like that. And again, they, I think they have different ones for kids. So it's just another environment, right? The nose and the lungs are two different environments where mold and I, Dr. Jill Christo was teaching like mold can actually like get into like the tiny little sacks of, of the lungs and like just be there. Um, so those are two, uh, two kind of specialty areas you may want to think about detoxing with mold. Yeah. And I don't have 
mold exposure that I'm aware of, but I did as a kid have strep throat often and had many, many rounds of antibiotics before having my tonsils and my adenoids taken out. And one thing I did as an adult was to do a lot of those nasal rinses and even some with xylitol or with different minerals um, and found I had likely biofilms sort of in my nose from where my adenoids were taken out and doing that for a while actually improved my sleep quite a bit. So I think it's something that can be helpful for people with allergies as well, or potential like sleep disturbances often can relate to inflammation in those nasal passageways that make breathing at night difficult. Um, you also mentioned in passing coffee enemas, and I don't think I've had the chance to talk about those on a podcast before. So I would love to just do a brief primer on coffee enemas. I'm guessing this is one that maybe people are a little bit hesitant to try. But from what I understand, it's also very supportive of the liver and of detox in general. But can you walk us through how coffee enemas are beneficial? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're definitely one that it's not common in our culture, right? So it's, however, they are something historically done, um, you know, in diff with different kind of medicinal ways. Even like the Bible mentions them, which is really interesting. And the Bible mentions mold. It's so this stuff has been around. Um, so yeah, I had been cautioned about it even in my functional medicine training that you know if your if your got your bile duct is clogged, like it could be really bad for you. So you know I do say you know talk talk with your practitioner. You know make sure you feel comfortable about it. People who are elderly have poor mobility. It can be just a kind of a little too awkward to be doing it. Um, so maybe it's not, or if you have, we have a couple more warnings. If you've got any issues with like um, hemorrhoids and prolapse or different things like that could be irritating um, to do coffee enema. And with that being said, there's a lot of people who will do well with coffee enema. You, you pretty much, you'll need to, I always say, give it like three tries because you're not going to out of the gate have a perfect experience. You're going to, you know, it's just new, right? It's just very stimulating. Um, I learned it from Dr. Jay Davidson. I still use basically the, the technique that, that he um, taught. Um, there is unfortunately not much study on coffee enema. You know, most of the techniques I talk about, there's a good amount of study. I think coffee enema is still a little bit of a mystery, but one thing we know is it has a compound, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, uh, that stimulates glutathione production uh, in the liver um, when it's exposed. So the, the purpose of an enema is usually, well, sometimes it's to have a bowel movement, but it's usually to get in sort of a medicinal substance to the bloodstream. So the colon, as it's vascularized, uh, is going to uh, affect the, the liver and that blood supply will go to the liver. So while you hold the coffee enema, and I can explain if you want more about like the whole procedure, um, that, that compound is getting exposed to the liver and the blood is passing through the liver, you know, constantly. And so it's kind of a cleanup, a cleaner for the blood as it goes through. Um, people often ask, well, can I just drink coffee? It's obviously not getting delivered in the same way, right? And when we're just drinking it. And then people say, well, I, I'm sensitive to coffee. What are the pros and cons? It is a little stimulating. I, I wouldn't say as much as a cup of coffee, Um and there are other options with enemas besides coffee enema, but they obviously won't have that same compound. So uh, again, you can just try it. Like if you're very sensitive to coffee, you know, you can do like a first round with just like warm water. Um, again, you just kind of have to try it and see it. But when I was very sick and very tired, doing sauna or coffee enema and dry and actually dry brushing were like my three little like lifesavers that would actually give me some energy. Um, so yeah, I still do them. I, I still do a coffee enema, I'd say at least once a week. Um, because I've gotten kind of like you said with the sauna, like it's like a it's like a little me time now. I actually really enjoy it. Um, it's really not like you might picture it's some giant mess and there's stuff everywhere. It's it's really not like that, right? You're doing it in the bathroom, you basically retain the coffee and putting it in slowly is really key. So your body doesn't, especially when you're new to it. Um, doesn't freak out. So I usually do a first round with just a small amount of coffee, kind of let that be my warm up round. Then you go to the bathroom and then I usually do two or three longer rounds holding the coffee. Um, you know, sometimes even though I'm still very experienced at this, 
I can't retain the coffee. I put in too much or what have you. And you just go to the bathroom and then, you know, do another round. So it's, it's not really that crazy or messy. And then while I have the coffee in, I can just, you know, read a book or I'll do my planner for the week or like, you know, you're just hanging out really. So, uh, you could also spend that time doing castor oil packs or, you know, um, gua sha or something like you mentioned. So you can make it like a productive little time. And yeah, to me, it just feels really good. Even if I feel like I'm coming down with something or whatever, I'm like, oh, I should do a coffee. I don't, I just, my son makes fun of me so hard. He's just like, you're addicted to coffee. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I, I, I think I'll do them my whole life. I like them. Yeah, I do the same thing. If I feel any kind of cold or anything coming on, I'll usually do a coffee enema and a long sauna session. And I would say 90% of the time it kicks it before it ever turns into anything where I actually feel sick. Um, so those are kind of my first line of defense. I'm curious if you've also ever done any kind of ozone related to mold. This is something I've been experimenting with lately. So it's top of mind. Um, I know that you can do rectal ozone as well as for women, vaginal ozone and or ozone water. I don't know if there's any specific evidence for that helping mold, but it's something that I've been enjoying lately. So I'm curious if you have come across that. Yeah, I have a little experience with ozone, not as much as like the coach on our team has done more of like the ozone machine at home, which is kind of maybe what you're describing. I've done ozone more as like a treatment where they, you know, they take out your blood and then mix it with ozone and then put it back in. Um, I've had, uh, you know, maybe eight of those, nine of those while I was sicker. I I would feel like a little boost, but it wasn't, I don't know. I don't feel like for me personally, it was like my game changer. Um, but yeah, I would, I would love to hear more and learn more. Like I do, I do know, like doing the ozone, you know, at home with the machine can be really cool. Uh, yeah. Ozone just basically like can kill a gazillion different germs. <laughs> Sounds like among other things. So yeah, I think there's a lot of potential. And I I don't know. I don't I guess like you can say I don't know all its potential. Well, and then I also want to just briefly touch on dry brushing because you've mentioned that a couple of times. And this is something I've also done for years. And I feel like I get an energy boost from it, but also it's really seems helpful for the skin and having yeah. had six babies and lost a lot of weight that was helpful for me in really tightening up the skin, which is still of course a process. Um, but this is another one that is really inexpensive because once you have the dry brush, there's not really any cost to it. And I feel like for women, especially can be a great, just daily practice to integrate. So maybe just walk us through dry brushing a little bit more. Yeah, I actually did it this morning. I'm like getting better about, you know, I was did it every day when I was really sick. And then I kind of went to the wayside as some things do. I, I'm getting back to doing it partly because I'm like perimenopausal and I like my weight is like fluctuating more with my estrogen. And then, so, you, you know, you get these areas where you're like, oh, I'm like feeling a little, like little lumpy, a little whatever. <laughs> Uh, and the dry brush is great for that too. So it's definitely energizing. Like you said, it's great for detox because it moves lymph. Um, it's good for just like skin vibrancy for sure. But then it's nice for those areas that are like, yeah, a little saggy skin, a little cellulite. Um, you can do it alone or you can do it with topical essential oil, like grapefruit. Um, and then you can do it with castor oil too, which is called wet brushing, which is something I'm just learning about. You may want to have a special brush to go with the castor oil, um, but that's like it's just a little extra skin treatment, detox treatment. Um, and then, you know, you can do it again, like on, on your belly area. I'm doing it definitely like on my butt area, <laughs> upper thighs right now. And I, I think it really helps. What do you find? Yeah. Similar to you, I find it really does help. And especially um, that paired with sprinting and good amounts of sun exposure without burning. I feel like those have all been really helpful for my skin health. And I also feel like when you do regular dry brushing plus regular sauna, where you get rid of dead skin cells as well, it's kind of almost like a Korean spa experience over time and that it helps remove dead skin and exfoliate and also brings just lymphatic movement and collagen to the skin a lot more easily. Um, especially when paired with all the other things we've talked about, like really nutrient dense diet and getting enough sleep. I think those are absolutely a baseline, but um, yeah, I definitely want to recommend and like we've talked about, very inexpensive to do. And yeah. I feel like compared to all the really expensive beauty treatments that women often get marketed, this is a really inexpensive one that also lets you feel great. So um, definitely 100%. recommend as well. 
Yeah, I was just going to say that, like, you know, if, as you're aging or your weight is changing or having kids or whatever, and you feel like, oh, you know, I want to work on some of these things, you can do it all like Katie's doing, like at home, really with, with, you know, maybe a small investment of a sauna. And like you said, you can get sauna options for so cheap now, if, if that's, um, you know, your budget. Um, you can really make your own little sauna, you know, your own little spa at home and, and do these things. And I really think it helps with the anti-aging and just that feeling of like, okay, I'm getting older and my body's changing, but like I'm taking care of it and I feel really beautiful and like I feel really vibrant. So yeah, it, you're not, you're sort of like keeping the power to yourself instead of like giving it away at, at some expensive clinic. So yeah, I think it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, that's definitely my approach is I'm perfectly fine with aging gracefully. And I know aging is a natural part of life and I'm not resisting that, but rather than spend money on things like Botox or laser treatments or whatever the things are people do, I'd much rather put that money toward a sauna and toward things that I can do at home and still be with like red light, things like that, where I'm home with my kids and still get to support my body on multiple levels by doing these things that are also systemically beneficial instead of just addressing the symptom cause on the skin. Um, I feel like the whole body approach is for longevity, a much better approach. Um, I know also you have so much more information than we can cover in a one hour podcast episode about this topic. I'll make sure I link to your work and your resources in the show notes, but uh, maybe walk us through where people can find you online and any resources you have available for people who are worried about mold exposure. Yeah, thank you. So my main website is just my name. It's Bridget Danner. Um, we have a bunch of free eBooks on there on mold or, you know, detox and different things. Um, we have a blog um, and I have a book on Amazon about mold and it's audiobook, print, Kindle. So any way you like it, it's a great resource if you're actually going through it. Even if you just suspect it, you can definitely pick up the book, but it's really meant to take you through this process, like start to finish. And it's a long process. So having the book to like reference is, is really helpful. Uh, and then on Instagram, I'm Bridget.Danner. And all those links will be in the show notes for you guys listening on the go, maybe taking a walk in the sunshine. Um, <laughs> so you can find all that at wellnessmama.fm. But speaking of books, another question I love to ask at the end of interviews is if there is a book or number of books that have profoundly impacted your life, and if so, what they are and why. Yeah, I'm going to mention a book I recently read, The Courage to be Disliked. Have you heard of that book? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just thought it was a really interesting philosophy. It's just like really makes you think about, uh, just sort of concepts about how to live your life. So, uh, I thought I'd give that one a shout out. Um, um, so yeah, lots of in influential books, but that's one of my favorites recently. I will put that link in the show notes as well. And lastly, any parting advice for the listeners today that could be related to mold and to everything we've talked about or entirely unrelated life advice. Yeah. One thing I'm learning, and then I think it's really important in your mold journey is to just like pace yourself. Um, you know, opportunities have their correct timing and like rushing life or trying to learn everything at once or stressing about all the options just doesn't serve you. It doesn't serve me. I'm learning that from, from me as well. Um, so yeah, you know, everything's gonna, gonna happen. And just, you just kind of have to like go with the flow of, of how it's unfolding, right. Rather than try to force it to unfold. So I would say that's, that's my advice. I love it. That's, I think a perfect place to wrap up for today. I'm so grateful for your time today, for all the work that you do and for everything you've shared with us today. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thanks as always to all of you for listening and sharing your most valuable resources, your time, your energy, and your attention with us today. We're both so grateful that you did. And I hope that you will join me again on the next episode of the Wellness Mama podcast.